It's an honor to introduce Christine Hogart, who is the technical director of Senfri, and she is going to be uh, helping us with moderating Recording the session. Recording in progress. So, Chris, uh, Christine, over to you, please. Thank you. Thank you very much, and good afternoon, everybody. I should almost say good evening, but not quite yet. <laughs> Um, so, welcome to this session on the transformative power of innovative regulation. Um, we're part of the digital finance stream of this conference, so we're going to focus today specifically on how innovative um, regulation can land within the financial regulatory space. There's been a lot of discussion um, throughout this conference about the role of tech and tech innovation and the role of data. And um, what we would like to unpack today is really how regulators can ensure robust consumer protection in this era, era of technological advancement. Um, and with that also, very importantly, how they can leverage tech as a tool in this quest to ensure robust consumer protection. And I think we're also interested in understanding, also in, 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 in line with the spirit of this conference, um, what are the different models for stakeholder collaboration um, in this quest? And also, how can regulators ensure that um, there's inclusion and um, no transparencies um, in this um, quest um, of using tech um, as a tool in regulation? And I see we've just been joined by one um, additional panelists. Um, I think we've got a great and diverse pa panel who can um, very well speak to these topics, and I'll quickly introduce themselves. Uh, them. Um, starting on my right here, I've got Paul Adams. He's the Director of Consumer Protection Research at Innovations for Poverty Action. Um, and they're a global research organization working to understand what works to improve the lives of people in poverty. He also happens to be an ex-regulator, formerly at the Financial Conduct Authority in the UK, so I'm hoping that he can speak to that angle as well. Um, next in line, we've got Melissa Coidy. Uh, she's the CEO of the FinReg Lab. They are a nonprofit testing new tech and data to inform public policy. So I think you work really on the, at the coal face of what we're discussing today, and it would be great to hear from you. Um, then we've got Rosie Thomas. She's Director of Campaigns and Communications for the Australian Consumer Association, called Choice. And she also happens to be an ex-regulator, formerly with the Australian Financial Services Regulator called ASIC. So Rosie, welcome, and we look forward to hear from you. Um, then um, we've got Juliet Ongwai. She's a senior subtech specialist at the Cambridge Subtech Lab. And what they do at the Cambridge Subtech Lab is capacity building and technical assistance. And I believe you also run a launch pad for the digital transformation of financial supervision. So I think a lot that we can learn from you. And then online, we're joined by uh, Matthew Sosorian. He's a policy advisor for financial consumer protection at the OECD. And I think the OECD needs no introduction, international body working to develop evidence-based standards and guidelines. Right, so I think on that note, let's jump straight in. And Juliet, I'm going to start with you. Um, so from your recent interventions, what trends are we seeing in adopting SUPTIC solutions globally? And if I may interrupt myself, maybe if you can just start by explaining to the lay people like me in the audience, what exactly is the difference between RegTech and SUPTIC? Okay. Um, so I'll start with the definition in my own understanding, um, but I'll put a disclaimer and say, I think the uh, um, two, there are two sides of the same coin. So when you think of, say, reg tech, we are looking at it from the supervised financial institution's point of view and looking at technology that then um, supports them to, to be able to meet uh, regulation or compliance requirements. So 
tech that is really sitting within uh, supervised financial institutions to support them um, with these changing compliance requirements and, and regulatory requirements. But when you look at um, soup tech, uh, we are looking at it from the supervisory um, authorities' perspective. So looking at technology and data that supports their day-to-day -day processes, so looking at workflow, looking at um, data analytics, looking at how they collect data, um, uh, store data, um, so that it can help them to monitor this compliance. That's my understanding. But really the conversation we should be having is not really around definition, but looking at how we can come up with taxonomies and standardization that can accelerate the two of them um, because they work hand in hand and there's divergence and convergence of the two, especially when you look at some of the technology. So in terms of um, your question around what are the trends we are seeing in soup tech, so within the lab we We've been um, doing research around soup tech adoption, and last year and this year we were able to send out surveys to uh, financial authorities across the globe to better understand the state of soup tech adoption, look at um, what emerging technologies they are um, that are supporting the soup tech, what uh, use cases um, are in demand in terms of soup tech. And from the data we see from last year and this year, I'll just throw out uh, a few numbers. So just general numbers first. We're seeing, definitely seeing an upward trend in terms of soup tech adoption, and about 80% uh, plus have reported some kind of soup tech um, initiative. So when you say initiative, looking at one or two applications already in uh, operating or um, in development, or some of them even have soup tech strategy. Um, that said, when you drill down on this data, you then start to see differences, especially um, where they are at on what we call the subtech um, uh, generation. So you find, say, uh, financial authorities in emerging uh, markets are probably in one or two second generation subtech. So looking at things like um, descriptive analytics, while you find others are well along that continuum and having conversations around AI. Um, we see uh, more than 78% have initiatives around data strategy and data policy um, and data governance. Um, more than 50 have actually introduced new roles within their institutions to lead digital transformation, lead soup tech, and lead um, data within their institution. Um, about 43% have ethics framework uh, initiatives ongoing, so either uh, a framework sitting within the institution or a framework, maybe uh, a regional framework that they tap into. 45% uh, already collect gender disaggregated data. Again, when you look at this um, and drill down, you see differences across uh, regions, across economies, across markets, but with the data, it's mainly demographic and transactional, and um, those are some of the uh, things we can discuss later. And finally, you see 8% reported, at least this year, reported that um, they have introduced Gen AI initiatives, which is um, part of the conversation we spoke uh, about earlier. Now, if we move to specific consumer protection and market conduct, you s when we ask them um, uh, the focus of their soup tech application, you find that uh, consumer protection was a second, just below prudential um, supervision. And in market conduct, um, and consumer protection, the, the soup tech um, applications mainly support two use cases, and the first one is data 
complaints data analysis, and the second one is facilitating complaints handling. So looking at uh, applications that uh, uh, support web scraping, sentiment analysis, social media uh, monitoring, um, we are working with uh, financial authorities that have actually introduced chatbots to facilitate these complaints handling, and also some that are working with natural language processing. Um, and finally, I just want to say that with all this, we still see challenges, which I think we'll discuss in this panel, um, challenges around quality of data, especially when you're talking about consumer protection and the type of data that we collect, um, issues around access of this data, confidentiality, consent, um, uh, issues around skills to analyze this type of data, and also um, the kind of infrastructure they have, legacy systems that are not able to support this kind of data and data analytics. Mm. I think from what you're saying, um, at first glance, it might sound as if SIPTIC is something, you know, very tech heavy and up there and in the air, and, but ultimately it boils down to the fundamental principles of supervision and just how you can really use tech um, in, in, in that quest. And you've, you've mentioned some of the tools and the challenges already, but if you can just expand for us a little bit, sort of what, um, how do financial authorities ensure accel accelerated adoption in light of the challenges that they face? Um, how do they go about to um, adopt and, and where do they start to adopt tools for SUPTEC? Um, so I'll start with capacity building. So we've been seeing a lot of investment in that. Um, they've recognized the need to build capacity. So it's not just about collecting the data, but how do we then move and get insights out of this data? Um, so a lot of investment in that. We see if we ground it in um, consumer protection, then we see them investing in this data privacy um, and protection kind of frameworks um, um, and understanding how um, they can protect the consumer at the end of it. Um, and third is um, collaboration, so a lot of exchange of knowledge, um, exchange of insights, best practices, emerging risks, um, so that they can support each other. Um, I see also a little investment around um, open finance, mm -hmm. open APIs, so to conversations around um, enhancing data sharing across. Yeah. And I think we'll definitely return to the questions of capacity building and also collaboration later on in the panel. Melissa, if I can maybe move to you. Um, so as I said in the introduction, FinRec Lab is playing a crucial role in, in generating data to inform public policy. Um, how and where is this data being leveraged for innovative regulation and policies? Thank you for having me. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here, and I'm so pleased to see so many people still in the room. Um, I stood up, and uh, we've been running as a nonprofit based out of the US for the past six and a half years. And I'm going to tell a little bit of a story to give you context about the work that we do. Before I created FinReg Lab, I was the head of the Office of Consumer Policy in the US Treasury Department. And it was at a point in time when we in Treasury were working with our regulatory colleagues, both on the Prudential side and also the newly formed Consumer Protection Bureau, and this stuff about data, new types of data, new analytics, and, and also virtual currency were hitting our radar. And the truth, and, and entities, non-bank entities, which are outside of the US, typically outside of the US regulatory perimeter, were also really sort of manifesting in big ways in terms of providing consumers with products and services. And the truth is, and I'm, I won't say where I was, but the, the anxiety and the worry that regulators have about how does this stuff work and where is it advantageous and where is it risky from a prudential standpoint to consumer harm risks mm -hmm. 
There's a lot of uncertainty, and frankly, that is amping up in spades with AI. Um, the work that we do when I, when I was a part of the Obama administration and when I left and stood up FinReg Lab, it was to get out there, engage regulators in conversations about what are those legal, policy, and regulatory relevant questions that you're grappling with, and how do we as an independent organization go and build research that directly responds to those questions that you have. So we set out in particular to both look at a high risk and high return product, credit underwriting. It's got enormous potential for giving economic opportunity, especially for lower income households, families and small businesses in the US. But it's also, as we know, has enormous risk to just deepen, deepen, deepen the inequality and the financial instability. And so we also realized we needed to separate because our laws and regulations think about the data somewhat separately than it thinks about the more complex analytics. And so you're hearing from experts on soup tech. We're really looking at these questions from how are law and policy evolving in the first place so that we are governing and making sure people are protected and our expanding financial universe actually also is prudentially sound. So we did some very deep analysis of alternative data, financial data, uh, what we call cash flow data, to really empirically generate the facts that help to illuminate, are these data even predictive in the first place? Do they help lenders extend credit to people who otherwise would be turned down, people who don't, people in small businesses who don't have a credit history? And do these types of data create a disparity between protected classes? In the US, this is race, this is gender, there are other uh, protected class characteristics. Because coming from the policy side, it's really hard to think about how do you, whether it's write new laws or evolve your regulations without understanding empirically what do a particular data type or a particular analytics, what does it actually do in terms of Again, protecting households, protecting the financial system, and really, ultimately, bigger issues around systemic risk. So, so we come at this work. I, I also want to be transparent. We've done a lot of deep work in the US. We are doing some work here in Kenya around similar issues, data insights for inclusion. But we're coming at it with direct engagement with regulators, whether they are the supervisors or they are the rule writing side because they are also thirsty and in need of fact-based information to help them think about how they're supervising directly or how they're thinking about evolving their laws and regulations. Mm -hmm. So hopefully that's a little bit of a helpful context setter in terms of the work that we do and how we are being responsive to how policymakers are really grappling with this opportunity but enormous risk associated with data and more complex analytics, which isn't just Gen AI, it's also lots of other uh, technologies and analytics. If I can just quickly follow up on that. So what data sets are you analyzing? Is it data that regulators already hold and they just don't have the tools to analyze and fully understand? Or is it data that you need to tap into from financial service providers directly? Say the first part again. Which, which, where which are we? data sets are you actually using to analyze? Is it data, data already sets. within Very, the very good no. question. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, and this has been an interesting aspect for us as well. Um, the cash flow analysis we did, I would argue for policymakers and regulators, being able to access whether it's industry grade models or data and analytics that are used by industry, whereby you can then, you know, evaluate, interrogate what are the data that industry themselves are using. Mm -hmm. So when we did the cash flow analysis, we actually got loan level data from five of six FinTech lenders who had already used that data. We had their performance information, we had the variables and the metrics, and then we interrogated how well do those variables actually predict risk. When we more recently did uh, an evaluation of machine learning approaches and questions around explainability and fairness, there we also use bureau data. Here in this case, you know this, we partnered with a team of economists from Stanford to go build the models. And while that research was enormously helpful, we've also learned 
that as we are, and we've now got a big project around cash flow plus machine learning as a form of AI, we've actually hired uh, model builders from industry in order to go about building the models because we do think that is a level of credibility with policymakers in terms of whether it's the models or the data and are they coming mm. from what industry uses. Mm. So you actually, the you're, you're helping to unearth insights from data that is out there, but it's not really being tapped. Yeah. Um, also, you mentioned AI, you mentioned machine learning now. Now, as they gain momentum in financial services, what challenges have you observed that could hinder consumer protection? Sure. So, so the work that we're doing that we haven't really publicly launched, but I'll, I'll tell you a bit about it. We wanted to isolate and understand the data and the implications of data that is frankly more inclusive because it is more representative. And that's, by the way, my mantra, it's the data dummy. We're all excited about AI, but it's the data. And what information are these models being trained on? But we isolated the data to interrogate it for its predictiveness, its inclusion, and its potential for disparity generation. Then we turned to really trying to dig in and understand these more complex analytics. And so here, with our partners at Stanford, we built uh, a Logit regression model, an XGBoost model, and a fairly simple neural net. Because in the US, if you are going to be generating a credit uh, decision outcome, you have to be able to tell the consumer why did they get the decision they got. That's not necessarily true everywhere. But that gets to this question around explainability. And with these more complex models, we were interrogating these approaches for do these techniques, I'm looking at you, these post hoc explainability techniques enable a lender to really interrogate how the more complex model is deriving its outcome. And the truth is our findings were encouraging but mixed. There is a lot of complexity in these models and there can be enormous complexity. And there are things that can be hidden and ways that you can generate explanations. On the other hand, we also found you can find what we have interrogated and found as ground truth through some of these post hoc explainability techniques. So there are risks in terms of what may be hidden within these more complex models. At the same time, the work that we're doing right now that we haven't publicly announced is we really want to understand how well do these machine learning algorithms, when they are trained on more inclusive and representative data, ultimately allow lenders to prudently, accurately credit risk populations who would otherwise be turned down with a logit regression and more limited credit bureau data. And we have our hypothesis, as you would imagine, about what those outcomes are. This gets to this question about, this stuff is so complex, and my goodness, we're all learning fast, we hope, about the complexity of machine learning and AI. How we're going to be able to bring, you know, or how the regulators themselves are going to get there, but how we can be helpful mm -hmm. as partners to them in terms of explaining. And so... The way that we go about doing that is we actually have them sit at the table with us as we're building the research design all the way to how are our models being built. We actually have an advisory committee that includes somebody from one of our federal mm -hmm. regulators who sits as a technical advisor. So they're getting to learn, but they're also getting to push and ask questions about how we're designing this research that's ultimately to inform sort of how they are evolving laws and regulations and, and how they may be thinking about enforcement. But it is highly, highly complex. Mm -hmm. And to your question, there are potential risks of consumer protection and things being hidden. I didn't talk about, you know, risks around disparities that may come out too, or that may be hidden in the models that you can't mm -hmm. necessarily see. These are, these are, there are lots of complex questions. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, we may get a lot of benefit from inclusion by moving to these more sophisticated uh, yeah. analytics. Yeah. And again, you touch on the collaboration topic, which I think is a theme throughout this panel. Um, Matthew, I'd like to turn to you. Um, in an increasingly globalized digital finance landscape, how are regulators working together to create new and harmonized regulatory frameworks that protect consumers? Thank you very much. Um, thank you for that introduction. I'm sorry that I can't be there with all of you in person. I wish I could. 
Um, but I will uh, try to respond to this question and, and uh, look forward to the rest of the discussion as well. So in um, your introduction earlier, you mentioned uh, or you referenced how the OECD works to develop standards and guidelines across a, a variety of sectors. And in, indeed, it's exactly through these instruments that regulators are working together to create effective and harmonized frameworks to protect consumers, which is increasingly important as the, the sector develops digitally um, and becomes more globalized as well. So exactly how we do that is through the OECD and G20 high-level principles on financial consumer protection. The principles are the leading international standard for effective and comprehensive um, financial consumer protection frameworks. Um, they're designed to uh, to apply in any jurisdiction uh, and across uh, any sector, cross-sectoral, so they can be applied to credit, banking, payments, insurance, uh, pensions, et cetera. And many countries, um, not only OECD member countries, but G20, FSB jurisdictions, and others um, have adopted these principles or use them to establish or enhance uh, their financial consumer protection frameworks. Um, the principles were originally developed after the global financial crisis um, as part of the, the global strategic response uh, coming from the G20, asking the OECD to develop these. But then given everything that has changed um, since, since the global financial crisis, um, the, the principles went through an update and revision uh, over 2020 to 2022 um, through a consultative process, uh, which included inputs from Consumers International, as well as uh, many members uh, from Consumers International, including Choice um, from Australia. Uh, and uh, so th those revised principles were um, approved and endorsed at the end of 2022. And some of the changes there were the addition of two new principles, uh, one on access and inclusion, which is an area that we've already spoken about today on the panel, uh, recognizing the interplay between consumer protection and uh, access. Um, and then another principle on quality financial products, which is a reflection of changes that have developed um, again since, since the global financial crisis um, and in the past 10 years, where regulators and supervisors have made um, a conscious effort to move beyond um, just focusing on disclosure and transparency as sort of the default uh, and moving towards implementing what's called product governance or product oversight regulation, where there's more of a focus on how do products actually get developed, um, looking at what is the underlying business model um, how do you ensure value for money? Um, it's, uh, it also relates to questions around suitability, um, uh, identifying a target market, and then developing a product around that target market. So we wanted to include that in the revised principles. And that's something that I would say is developing in different ways in different regions around the world. Um, but there's a lot of potential and there's a lot of interest in that. So that's partly why um, that was included. And then um, to touch upon what you were just mentioning about digitalization, so the other change to the principles was the addition of three cross-cutting themes, um, one of which is on digitalization, another on financial well-being, and uh, finally on sustainable finance. Um, so just to say that in terms of working together, um, the principles encourage uh, both international collaboration, which can happen through a variety of forums, including forums that are that are um, uh, facilitated here at the OECD, through the G20, et cetera. Um, and also there's the principles call out the need for collaboration um, and coordination within countries as well, uh, coordinating across different types of regulators. And this is also increasingly, increasingly important as data becomes more relevant in the financial sector, uh, protecting consumers' privacy, um, ensuring that their data is used in responsible uh, ways. So that will require further and enhanced collaboration between uh, data protection authorities, competition authorities, financial uh, sector regulators who are focused more on prudential, as well as conduct uh, regulators or conduct supervisors as well. Um, so I think there's a lot of a lot of um, growth that's happened recently in this area, and uh, we're looking forward to contributing to contrib continuing to contribute um, as we can in our role as a as a global forum. 
Great, thanks. Um, I think personally, I was very um, glad to see that uh, inclusion can be a, a principle of financial consumer protection because often those were seen as, as, as trade-offs. Um, and also that quality financial uh, services, in, 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 in other words, looking more towards the outcomes for fi financial consumers themselves is now entrenched um, in the principles. Just in terms of the work that you're doing and working with regulators, what do you think can be done to hasten the adoption of innovative subtech and regtech um, solutions? Yeah, that's a that's a great question. And I would say that um, one of the important things that I think to that important something that's important to stress is that there are a lot of tools and a lot of technology that can be very beneficial to make uh, regulators and supervisors carry out their work more effectively and more efficiently. And I think that in particular in jurisdictions that face significant resource constraints, that hastening the adoption of these tools um, has the potential to bring a lot of benefits. Um, at the same time, I think one of the key messages from us is that it's also important to ensure that the basics are in place. Um, and that can be the basics in terms of uh, regulation, so consumer protection regulation. Um, so the, in terms of, as I said earlier, disclosure and transparency, we can think about those as the basics, but we know that in many jurisdictions, a lot of that can be missing. Um, as well as things like ensuring that someone's credit line can't be increased without asking them or without letting them know, um, things like that that are important to ensure that consumers don't become over-indebted, for example. Um, and that's that's something that it, it, you could think of as kind of the bread and butter of consumer protection that needs to be in place um, before or at the same time that you're also exploring these technology and and um, and tools that are now available. Um, so just want to stress that it, it one shouldn't come at the expense of the other. And then in terms of hastening the adoption, I think one of the things that we've seen um, both in, in the OECD work, but also we we serve as the as the secretariat for a network of market conduct supervisors that's called FinkoNet. So that's all focused on supervising market conduct, supervising financial consumer protection. And they've also done some work on soup tech. And one of the messages coming out of their work in terms of soup tech for market conduct is is in, is um, emphasizing the importance of having a strategy in place from the beginning to ensure you know what you're trying to get out of these tools and also to ensure that different parts of the house, so to speak, are all working together um, towards a common goal um, because otherwise it can become uh, um, sort of fractured or, or yeah, it can be, it can become, um, there can be a lack of coordination within an institution without having a strategy in place. Um, so that's one of the one of the key areas that that we think uh, jurisdictions and and authorities should focus on as they begin on this journey. Yeah. So what I hear from you is again that um, tech is a tool and it's very a useful tool, but the tail shouldn't wag the dog. It's important to have the basics in place and to have a strategy for how you go about this. Rosie, I'd like to turn to you now. Um, you you know, can speak from your experience as a regulator, but you also now represent a consumer association. What role do you think consumers or associations can play um, to support regulators and in engage with regulators as they embark on this journey of developing innovative regulatory solutions? Thank you for the question. It's great to be here. Um, before I answer the question, I just wanted to start with a definitional point. I'm going to borrow from you. It, it, it's the data dummy or the data dummy because I don't say data. <laughs> um, I love that. Um, I had some apprehension, apprehension joining this panel because I don't like buzzwords and there's lots of them. Soup tech, reg tech, innovative regulation. What do all these things mean? I don't know. Various people asked me when they saw I was on this panel. I, don't, I didn't really have a very good answer. Um, and so I wanted to sort of start by acknowledging like really what we're talking about is data and analysing that data through whatever means it's available to a regulator depending on their resources and capability and everything else. Um, so it's the data dummy. It's, that's going to be my new way to describe um, all, everything that this panel is about. 
Um, but coming back to the question, what's the role for consumer organisations? In a word, I think it's advocacy. So consumer groups have a role both to advocate for regulators to be able to ha use and access the da data and analyse it, um, and also to advocate to ensure that is done in a way that is inclusive and safe. So I might start now sort of focusing on, I suppose, the opportunities that come from access, regulators having access to data and the analytical tools. Um, and I think later in the discussion, we'll probably come back to some of those issues around inclusivity and um, safety. So opportunities for consumer protection from um, data analytics by regulators using data better. Um, Really, I think this boils down to regulators being able to better understand the real-world outcomes that consumers are getting from financial products and services. Um, there's also the... That helps inform policy. It helps um, regulators identify where they should be prioritising their energy. It helps identify the providers who might need a bit more attention and enforcement action or whatever the right regulatory tool might be. There's also the potential for regulators to publish that data um, and that can drive improvements in other ways as well. You know, sunlight can be very, very effective and sometimes doesn't require the same kind of regulatory effort if you can just be transparent about what's happening in a particular market. Now, I mean, all of this requires data and often that data has to come from the industry. Um, and sometimes to be useful, it needs to be structured in a particular way or it needs to be standardised to be useful. And so this means two things. You need regulators who are properly resourced to be able to um, collect, store, analyse the data. And so I think the resourcing is one of the things that consumer advocates can um, advocate for or making sure that regulators have the resourcing they need. Um, but also regulators need the powers to collect data or, or appropriate obligations on the finance industry to report the data. Um, and I think a lot of people assume this is always there, but at least my experience in Australia is sometimes it's not. Um, and particularly when it comes to recurrent data, you can't need to serve a notice to get the data every single time. Um, and so... That needs just old-fashioned regulation. It needs laws. Um, and that's something that I think is very familiar to consumer groups in terms of advocacy and um, campaigning to get those laws passed and implemented. It's not sexy. It's really not advocating for regulators to have data collection powers. But it's important, I think, um, for regulators to be doing their jobs properly. So part of our role... Um, for consumer group, as consumer organisations, is convincing decision makers of um, the value of regulators having the resources and the powers to collect and use this data. Um, and I think one th point I'll make there is um, there's often quite strong pushback from the finance industry when it comes to reporting data. It can be costly. I think particularly in a country like Australia where we have lots of well-established legacy finance institutions with lots of legacy systems, when they, the regulators start asking them to collect data that they don't currently collect or it's in a million different systems, they hate it and they run straight to the politicians to talk about the fact that the regulators are, you know, it's, an undue, it's unreasonable what they're asking for. And so I think having a counter voice to sort of highlight that, yes, it's expensive and costly, but this is a necessary part of making sure the regulators can um, supervise the finance sector and the outcomes that they're delivering for consumers is, um, I think, really important. I, I might stop there. Actually covered the second question as well, but I think just one thing um, I want to add to what you said there is that... Um, um, yeah, I'm online. Um, there's only so much you can get from reported data from financial services themselves. And I think what you can also advocate for is... 
Am I now online? Okay. I think what you can also advocate for is for the regulators to do surveys with consumers themselves. Um, in my home jurisdiction in South Africa, we ran a big nationally representative consumer su survey specifically um, targeted at understanding their outcomes from, from financial services usage. So just me adding my two cents worth to that. Okay, great. Paul, you get to go last. Um, I just want to you to explain to us how IPA is using new data sources and research techniques to help emerging market regulators monitor consumer risks and protect consumers from harm. And maybe along with that, what of these new approaches do you think show the most promise for improving also the financial health of consumers? Thanks, Christine, and thanks for having me here. It's been a fantastic two days. Um, please bear with us for the last 20 minutes or so of this session, and uh, I'll keep it brief because I'm really looking forward to your questions. A um, little bit of intro to, to the Consumer Protection Research Initiative, uh, which is what I'm running at the moment at IPA. It's a four-year program. Uh, we've had 25 projects in 10 different countries uh, in emerging markets. And we're trying to bridge the, I wouldn't say gap, but sort of bridge between uh, regulators on the one side, policymakers, but also academics, right? And that's the kind of unique position uh, that IPA has where we can uh, interface in these, in these two worlds. And so, yes, it's the data dummy, but it's also what you do about that with that data. And, and what we're trying to do is leverage the expertise uh, the time, the resources, the intelligence of academics in bringing new ideas, new data, new approaches to bear on regulatory problems. And those problems might be market monitoring, they might be diagnosing what's going on in the market, they might be developing new solutions for policy um, uh, to implement. Uh, so you asked about data and, and research approaches, new data, new research approaches. A lot of these are new to regulators, but perhaps not new to people in this room because I've heard a lot of these in the last two days. Uh, so that's really good that, that this is becoming more mainstream. But I'll just mention a handful of examples just to give you a flavor of what we've been doing. Um, so social media data has been talked about a lot as a kind of natural complement, something that's available out there in the world. Um, unfortunately, Twitter has recently made it much more difficult to get hold of, but uh, there are still some sources out there that you can use. And we've used social media um, listening, uh, along with sort of uh, sentiment analysis, predictive analytics, uh, in countries like Kenya, um, Nigeria, and Uganda. Uh, Complementing third-party data like social media, We've also used um, Play Store, so Google Play Store review data uh, and meta data from, from, those, uh, from, that, from that Play Store to identify fraudulent apps. So this is not sort of a fraudulent actor acting alone. This is a, um, an app that is claiming to be a, um, a, a consuming, consumer lending firm, is offering loans, but either those loans uh, never materialize or they uh, end up being at very sort of predatory rates and, and with very poor and, and harmful service. Uh, and we've looked at that in uh, countries like India, Nigeria, and the Philippines. And finally, perhaps more sort of common ground for regulators is, is this kind of bread and butter of complaints data that often regulators are collecting. Um, but don't necessarily have the tools and capacity to analyze it to its full extent. Um, and we've done complaints data analysis in a number of different countries, uh, including Uganda and now more recently in Nigeria. On top of that, and sort of especially for the Kenyan market, uh, we've worked with the Competition Authority of Kenya, so great to have them uh, sponsoring this event and in the room, uh, looking at administrative data from firms. So this is going out there and collecting um, granular loan level performance data from digital lenders in the Kenyan market. And that can tell you an incredible amount about the market, market dynamics, 
firm behavior, how are the firms pricing and what are, how are they treating their customers, but also consumer behavior. And I think that's really important that you get down to the level of consumer because there's such variability in how they behave and how they're repaying their loans and how these different services are affecting uh, different individuals. So I'm going to pause there because I want to get plenty of questions, but we can get into more of the specifics as we go through. Maybe just one question, Paul, if I can go slightly off script. Um, how open and also able do you find the regulators that you work with to now act on these, these insights and use it to also adopt more innovative ways of, of supervision? I, th I think the experience so far has been mixed uh, in terms of some regulators being very open to these, to these new data sources, very open to working with external academics, for example, very open to the idea that they need to, to relinquish, um, not relinquish control, but to, to open up some of that data to, to allow these opportunities to come in. Um, I think it's early days on acting on some of that, and it goes back to Matthew's point, I think, of having the principles and the frameworks and the, the basics in place so that, okay, you've spotted this risk through this amazing data, this new research, and this new approach, but then, okay, what's causing that problem? Like, where is the problem coming from? Is it an information problem for consumers? Is it uh, a conflict of interest somewhere in the kind of supply chain? Um, is it a competition issue? Because you need to think about what is causing the, the problem in order to be able to design effective solutions. And I would say that's one thing to kind of add on to the list of uh, innovative approaches, is then once you do get to think about your solution, is you know, I, my background is, is as a regulator as well, and at the FCA, what we did a lot of is running randomized controlled trials. So these are, you know, impact evaluations sim similar to a medical trial that, that pharmaceuticals have to go through in order to really test what works for consumers. Not only what we think will work, but what actually works. And I think it's definitely a journey that um, all regulators, advanced and emerging market regulators, have to go through to build up their capacity from monitoring markets, diagnosing problems, solving those problems, and using innovative approaches at each step in the way. Great. Thanks, Paul. I'd like to now open it up to the audience and ask your, your views, hear your views, hear your experiences, and also hear your questions about the role of technology in um, ensuring more effective <coughs> consumer protection outcomes. Over there. Hi, hi, everyone. It's Juan Carlos Iseguirre from CIAP. I have a, one comment and two questions. Uh, one quick comment. Totally agree with the importance of data, especially for monitoring markets and consumer protection issues. My question is, one is, any of your initiatives is also helping supervisors translate their data to more digestible messages for the market so that they know what their findings are. Because sometimes we stay at the data or academic level, but those findings may not be translatable to the consumer organizations or to other actors that would benefit from that data interpretation. And second point is whether there is any, any reflection on how also like customer stories that consumer organizations can uh, better understand and collect could complement the data that is being collected through these technological issues. So maybe a comment whether you could see, for example, our colleague from, from Choice, that complementarity of the more hmm, hard data, right, results with the more soft data, uh, stories even that can complement and provide a much more comprehensive or maybe real kind of live data. Thank you. I don't know who wants to take the first part of the question and then Rosie, you can take the second. Juliet, thanks. Thanks, 
Yeah, I could take one of your questions, um, and it's around this data product that feeds to the customer, like a feedback. So from what we see, they are still struggling even to collect data, let alone move all the way to um, having these insights that they can share even internally to make decisions, let alone externally. But from what I see, especially with the ones that have started um, um, working with chatbots, is having it now a, a two-way. So um, one way is collecting the complaints and feedback, but also now using it like a knowledge base and FAQs um, based on these complaints. So as you receive um, the complaints and, and build insights around this information, you're able now to share it back uh, using the same kind of technology for them to consume through either FAQs or some kind of knowledge base. Um, is, some, is what I can think of. Can I just clarify, so the question was, are there ways to use the hard data from the regulators to sort of repackage it, I suppose, for consumers? Yeah, I mean, there's a few different examples I can point to. Um, so, Choice, we test products, um, and that includes financial products, um, and so our insurance reviews take into account, for example, the data that is publicly available about insurance claims, handling practices and complaints and things like that, and so when someone is looking at our insurance comparisons, they're also factored into that is um, the data that's available, either from the regulator or um, the ombudsman, um, on what the outcomes are. Um, but I suppose another example um, that we've been thinking about more and more is our role in the storytelling off the back of a regulator's you know, publication. I'm allowed to say this because I used to be a regulator, but some of them are a bit hard to digest. Um, there's lots of words and they're not always the most um, captivating. And um, But to be effective, regulation needs to be communicated. It needs to be um, amplified. And so, um, yeah, we have on occasion sort of worked with the regulator where we know there's something coming out to try and find the case study to give a human face to the story that um, the regulator might have taken action or be putting a report about. Um, hi, I'm Samuel Sanya. Um, until recently, I was the head of um, uh, the, the uh, communications at the um, Capital Markets Authority, which is the, capital, the securities regulator in Uganda. Um, and I agree with a lot that Rosie has said, and, and good that Paul is collecting some data over there. Um, I just um, have a concern maybe about um, our approach to maybe RegTech. I think there's an assumption that you want to do um, a sort of a survey using a tool. Meanwhile, regulators need um, an always-on tool that will always um, gather this, because one of the things that I was in charge of as head of communications was being that liaison with the consumers to collect complaints and use those complaints to create a risk profile, which risk profile then I would give to the supervision team and the legal teams. Uh, we had a big case, which is still going on. Uh, there was, I think you've all heard of the one coin, the crypto queen who set up in, um, in the US and the case is still going there, and China, and then came to Uganda and set up in a rural area where we didn't expect that the rural people would buy into a complex product like cryptocurrency, but lo and behold, they did. And then this person is in the US and China where we expect that they are more complex in, in the way they do this supervision, but lo and behold, about four billion pounds was lost. Uh, through that system. So that can create some economic uh, repercussions. Um, so really, um, just two questions. One is on how do regulators work together using this tech? Because most of the times we kind of sit on our data and don't want to share that. But here's a person who's going to China, the US, and of all countries just coming to rural, rural Uganda, not the cities, but a place which is not the, 
If you look at risk-based supervision, we wouldn't think that that's an area where there's all of risk, but it happened. So one is about collaboration, and then the other one is gathering all his own data. So you have a tool that is getting all this data and can process it. It's pretty hard sometimes for a regulator to get the, the legal approval to collect that kind of data if you're not in the intelligence services or those people that typically process data. We're looking at more structured data and that kind of thing. So yeah, just those are my mm -hmm. comments. Thanks. So I'm wondering, Matthew, if I can ask you to maybe look at into the first question, which, if I understood it correctly, is how do regulators work together across borders um, to deal with tech that really sort of um, surpasses jurisdictions and, and, and borders? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's, uh, it's very challenging. It presents a, a huge challenge for regulators uh, globally. Um, part of it, I think, is through using uh, the forums that exist already. Um, so, you know, for, for securities fraud or for securities um, uh, supervision, the IOSCO is the, is the standard setting body and brings together those institutions to, to share what they're experiencing, the risks they're identifying in their markets, and hopefully to also to facilitate collaboration uh, in terms of having a harmonized approach. Um, when it comes to, to law enforcement issues of, of you know, uh, actual fraudulent activity, then that's a, that's a different conversation that gets a little bit beyond the scope of, of market conduct supervisors, um, but it's definitely, it's definitely related. And I, if I can just make a, a small comment based on, on the second question about, um, if I understood correctly, about, about enforcement or about responding to, to um to misconduct. Uh, I think that it's also important in these conversations about data and about collecting data to keep in mind why are we collecting this data in the first in the first place and what are we trying to achieve with it? And for regulators and supervisors, I think ultimately uh, we can't lose sight of the power of enforcement. Um, because if we don't act on this data that is collected, um, then the then to me, it's a it's a missed opportunity, and it's also maybe a, 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 a not focusing on on perhaps the the one of the greatest tools that that are in the in the toolbox, uh, which is actually enforcing and uh, taking action against misconduct, because that sends the message to the rest of the market about what is okay and what is not okay. Um, so just keeping that in mind, I think, is is an important element. Thanks, Matthew. And Melissa, if I can maybe ask you about the second question about um, regulators needing access to an always-on tool. In terms of data analysis and the way that you approach it, is it something that happens periodically or is it an always-on stream that regulators have on tap? So, I, I mean, I spend more time on the front end on the sort of policy development side. So the data always on isn't something that we've spent a lot of time thinking about. I think on the other question, I, I, um, uh, the question of like the shared information and intelligence, I agree the standard setting bodies are the way to go. Ooh, and, and I do wonder actually like, you know, has FATF been brought in, you know, the Financial Crimes Enforcement Task Force? because this kind of knowledge sharing across jurisdictions and geographies is so, so essential for knowledge sharing, but also going after the bad actors. Sorry to punt on the first one, but that's not where we're spending a bunch of time. <laughs> I, I can comment on the first one. I, I don't know how widespread this is, but in Australia, ASIC is both consumer protection and market integrity regulator, so the securities regulator. Um, and so to identify in, um, insider trading and market manipulation um, in equities markets, so shares, they have real-time, constant... <laughs> sorry my alarm going off, um, data right down to individual transactions constantly coming in, um, which is how they supervise the, the equities market and identify, you know, potential insider trading. So the, these tools exist, um, but they require significant 
investment, um, you know, building that was not a small thing. And uh, one of my frustrations has been, wouldn't it be amazing to have that level of data in you know, a credit market or um, buy now, pay later, all these various markets that we've all been talking about and trying to design the right policy interventions for. Um, but I mean, it seems like a fantasy, yet it, it, it is there for um, you know, other areas where consumer protection is not so much the goal. Right. I I think we need to wrap up now. I didn't see more hands in the audience. So, Paul, I'm going to put you on the spot, if you don't mind. What is your key takeaway from the discussion today? Yeah, big one. Um, <laughs> I think especially it comes to the last question as well, right? Like collaboration and cross-border data sharing. Like, I think we talked about it here in terms of securities or crypto. But we have spent a lot of time for the last two days talking about fraud and payment fraud um, or loans, as, as Rosie just mentioned. And I think you could see similar um, cross-border, real-time data collection, layering on some predictive modeling, machine learning, whatever you need to do to flag potential risks. And I think you know, if you want to come back here in four years' time, maybe that's, that, that would be what I would aim for. Mm. in the next four years. Mm. And ultimately, um, ultimately what, what I take home from this, because I was very intimidated by this whole topic of tech and you know, machine learning and all of the fancy things along with it, but basically it boils down to effectively leveraging data for the inclusion and protection of all consumers in society, and that's I think, a positive note to end off on. Thank you very much, everybody, for your participation. Thank you to the panel. And um, yeah, enjoy the rest of your evening.